All right, let me just share this. Okay, hello, good evening, everybody. Hello, hello, thanks for joining us. Um, we are here to talk about writing research articles as part of the National English Teacher Olympiad. But it's not just about um, the competition, it's really more just strategies for, for writing, um, good writing in research. Um, my name is Katie Miller. I'm an English language fellow working with Lingua Foundation this year. Um, the Olympiad is supported by the Ministry of Education and Science and the U.S. Embassy here in Kyrgyzstan. Um, this is the fourth year of the competition. Um, these were some of the reasons for starting and continuing the competition. Um, the possibility to learn more about communicative methods of language teaching. Giving practitioners a chance to reflect and um, complete some professional development about their teaching. And also just challenging yourself to, um, you know, develop new new skills, try something new. And research and writing articles is not necessarily something that we have time for if we're instructors, right? If we're teaching at the university level and we're juggling all of our classes, um, this is something that's kind of like, all right, let's take a pause, let's reflect. Um, the contest is open to any state-run or private university English language teacher uh, who's a citizen of Kyrgyzstan. And it's also open to pre-service master's candidates. So students who are completing a master's program with the goal of becoming an English teacher are also invited to, um, to take part in the competition. Uh, it's about writing an academic article. And we know that a lot of master's candidates are doing just that. Um, so the... Um, the contest officially, the submission of the article needs to be turned in by February 10th, 2024. So we had just over two months from between now and then, and then winners will be announced in April um, and prizes awarded and uh, a ceremony happening shortly after. So for the National Olympiad article competition, there are prizes, laptops, printers, there's certificates for the official winners and, and runners up. And there's also the opportunity to publish your article in Roundtable Magazine, which is a nationwide publication for English language teachers here. But not just uh, publishing in Roundtable, really, um, really what we just love to do is just be able to shine a light on all of the good things that are happening in university level teaching here in this country. So I'm thinking not just Roundtable Magazine, but so many other journals and publications out there that would love to hear about your experiments and your results and your strategies when it comes to English language teaching. Um, so I'm going to pause here and see if anybody has any questions about the contest itself that we can answer before we go into talking about writing an article. Okay, if you think of a question later, feel free to drop it in the chat and we will get back to that. All right, so what we're gonna talk about tonight with writing an article is we're gonna talk about the structure, the conventions and the format. Um, and these are general guidelines to research articles. If you've been researching and writing recently, then this is something that's probably already in your head. This might be something that you're like, oh, I haven't done that in a number of years. Let me remember, let me kind of, take it out of my brain and dust it off a little bit. So those are the kind of things we're gonna cover. I do wanna point you in a good, uh, one, one direction here to look at some good resources, some good examples is on the American English website, americanenglish.state.gov. You will find English Teaching Forum, which is a journal. It's published four times a year and it's by English teachers for English teachers. Um, and it has to do a lot with theory, practice of that theory, um, strategic interventions, basically what's working in different people's classrooms? What have they investigated? What have they tried? And they're sharing that knowledge out. So this is a great place to look for examples 
of, of academic articles about language teaching and learning. And it's also a place that you might think about submitting an article to. Um, you can find on their website submission guidelines um, and how to how to format your article, how to submit it, what they're looking for, and some more specific guided questions uh, for their publication. So let's think about articles. Um, we've written papers before, right? We've written papers when we were in college, when we were in university or graduate studies. Um, maybe it's been a while or maybe it's something you just did last week. Um, what does an article include? What are the components or the parts of a successful article? I apologize. This this session is more to more to inform rather to, than to be an interactive workshop. Um, so it's okay. We don't have to do breakout rooms and chat about it. It's totally fine. Um, basic your your minimum structure. Your basic at a minimum structure should include an introduction, a body, and a conclusion, right? So this type of format can work really well for articles that are about general teaching strategy. So things that you do or things that the teachers in your department do that are really great and you want to publicize them. Or maybe your article is more of like a storytelling experience. So something that you've been noticing in your classroom um, and you have some anecdotes that kind of frame uh, what you're talking about. And so you have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Um, it could be a, a generalized article where you're describing a problem and then offering some solutions or you're bringing up an idea or a trend and then offering some strategies about that. And all of this, of course, is going to be, you know, based on research. Um but this is like basic minimum structure, right? Introduction, body, conclusion, right? So our introduction is general. We get down into more specific ideas and details. And then our final part of our article ends on more generalized notes. Now, if you're doing classroom research, action research, then that's gonna have a very different, more standardized format, right? So your research article is going to have an abstract, an introduction, a section on methods, a section of your results, a discussion section, and then finally at the end, your references. So your article is taking your readers through the entire research process from, from beginning to end, from A to Z, from soup to nuts. Um, so the idea that anybody who reads your article could, could try to replicate your research with their own groups of learners or in their own institution. So everything is very uh, clear and transparent and standardized in terms of structure. So we'll talk about these things one-on-one. -on -one. So an abstract is a short summary of your research overall. And that's very short, very short, one paragraph, 120 words usually, not very much at all. Some publications will require an abstract. Others don't. But an abstract is a good idea to help frame your article because after you've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words, are you able to summarize your own article in just one tiny paragraph? Probably. And that's a good exercise too as a writer to be able to take a giant process that you've described and get it down just to its core essential ideas, right? Um, abstracts are what, what people first see when they're doing their own research. So if you're publishing an article with a great strategy that you've tried or some really interesting data, some really interesting results, then by including an abstract, that's gonna help people be able to find your topic and how it connects to them. So while abstracts are not always necessary when you submit something for publication, they're very helpful because depending on the way the publication is indexed, that abstract is gonna bring readers to you. Your introduction, obviously you're creating like the big picture about what your topic is and how it's contextualized or grounded in research. So this is where you're reviewing the literature. What have people already found out about this topic? What have other scholars, other teachers, other researchers, professors, um, what have they already said about this? 
And that leads you to the specific problem that you're investigating. Because maybe there's a gap or maybe there's an unanswered question. Maybe you found a lot of studies in primary school, but there's no studies about that same phenomenon in the university level, right? So by reviewing the literature, you can see, all right, this is what other people have saying are saying about it. This is how my topic connects to it. This is where my ideas fit into this giant discourse surrounding this topic in education. But here's where my research is going in a slightly different direction that people haven't explored before. So it's giving a bigger context, showing how your research question fits in with it and kind of takes it in a new, new direction. So that's your introduction. Your next part of your research article is going to be describing your methods, right? So all of the details, very, very clear. The big idea here is that you want to make these details as clear and explained as possible so that another researcher can try it. Another researcher says, oh, wow, I read this fantastic study um, by this uh, uh, professor out of Bishkek State, Bishkek State University. I want to try and replicate that study with my group of learners here in this country, in this context. And then the method is spelled out for them. So answering questions like, who are the people in your study? Who are the participants? How many? Is it a class of 25 students? Is it all the students that you teach? Um, what are the characteristics about their gender or their age um, or their population? For example, you know, what would be important? Is it a beginner uh, English class or is it advanced students in a writing class? So what is it about? Is it, is it professional students who are English majors or is it students who are in um, a STEM field who are learning English as part of their, their degree program? So what are the characteristics about your learners that, that really make it clear, maybe helping to explain why, um, why you chose to do the study with them? Um, your methods should also include your stimulus. Um, so if you gave them a prompt to respond to, then what, what, what exactly was that? So you can describe it in your method section, but also it's a good idea to attach it as an appendix at the end of the article. Um, maybe you gave them survey questions. Maybe it was a questionnaire. Um, maybe you had them answer questions on a Likert scale. Okay, on a scale of one to five or uh, agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. So maybe you gave them items like that to respond to or just simple yes, no. Um, so what, were, what, what did the stimulus look like? And including a copy of that so that people can read that at the end and ideally replicate your study with their own context. And you're also gonna describe your procedures. So what exactly did you have them do? And when you think about this, the steps should be in order with an explanation. Why did you do this first instead of second? So for, exa so for example, think about you want to create perfect conditions for your learning to happen. You want to create perfect conditions as much as possible to collect your data. So you want to think about what problems are you controlling for? What nuances uh, are you controlling for? For example, I'll tell you about the really great time uh, when I was teaching high school some years ago, I decided to give my students a quiz on a Friday, right? It was the end of the week. I wanted to give my students a quiz and I was going to report the results of that quiz in my, my end of the year evaluation, right? So this is like a big thing. Well, stupid me, I didn't look at the calendar and I didn't realize that that Friday was going to be an early dismissal for a big um, celebration at the school. So I chose, to gave a, I chose to give a quiz on the worst day of the year to give a quiz because the school was closing early for a celebration. None of my students were focused on the quiz. Nobody took it seriously. Nobody gave their best. Everybody was just talking about, you know, the exciting events that were going to be happening in the gym and, you know, later that day. So, yeah. So think about like, okay, I really want to collect data under the best conditions. So how do I control for problems? Also think about bias, right? Um, if you do activities in a certain order 
and then you give students a survey to take, are they going to be influenced by what they just did when they go to take the survey? Right? You don't want to like steer them in a direction. You want to try to collect things honestly and, and transparently. So making sure that the procedure of your research collection doesn't open itself up to like any type of bias or any type of skewed results because you kind of let other influences in, right? And you know, <laughs> you, like it's like you never give a test the day before a holiday, right? Nobody, nobody cares, right? So the, kind of the same idea with setting up your research. All right, so once you collect your data, then you're gonna report it in the results section or the findings section. And what's here is just numbers, just straight up numbers, just the raw numbers, the raw data. It can be statistics, it can be percentages, it can be graphs, it can be charts, like the example chart here. Um, you're also explaining what type of analysis did you use? If you're using fancy statistical analyses, that's wonderful. You can explain what method was used to calculate the data, right? For example, here, this was just counting tokens. Counting tokens of if clauses, cause and effect, and then finding averages finding percentages. I mean, you know, so you can explain how the data is organized based on what type of calculations or analysis you ran. Right here in the results, you're not interpreting. You're not, you're not explaining your thoughts on this. You're just presenting the numbers, just the facts. Your next session is the part where you really get to shine because this is where you get to discuss the data. So in the discussion center, in the discussion section, you're interpreting the results. So what story are those numbers telling? I'm looking at a chart and I'm seeing numbers, 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 numbers. Okay, help me make sense of it as the reader. What story are those numbers telling and how does this fit into that bigger context that you explored in your literature review back in your introduction, okay? Did you have a hypothesis? Well, I noticed that my students were struggling with writing, so I decided to do this type of writing instruction for two weeks, and then I gave them a writing assessment. Well, did you think that that was going to increase their writing proficiency as measured by whatever rubric you're using? And did, did, those, did those results match? So did those results match the hypothesis that you, you, know, that you were thinking about? And if they didn't match, then why not? Why do you think? Why do you think what went wrong? Why did all of my students do really bad on a quiz? I gave them <laughs> the day that school was closing early for a celebration. Well, gee, I wonder why, right? So you're explaining maybe where if things didn't match your expected um, your expectations, then it's okay to take a step back and discuss why not? Or why do you think? Um, there could also be limitations on your study. So there's maybe there's something that's still not clear. Well, I noticed that my students' um, list, uh, my students' reading comprehension scores increased when I did X, Y, and Z, but I'm still not clear exactly if it was the influence of my instruction or if it was the influence of this. Um, you know, I got all this data back from the stu the students that said that they really enjoyed my class when I had them just like open ended questions, and they said they enjoyed the class, they enjoyed the class, they liked the class, but. Well, that's still not clear because they're not being specific enough about what they liked about the class or what they enjoyed, right? So maybe there's still some unanswered questions. Like good research starts with a question, tries to find an answer, but then really just poses more questions, right? That's what research should do is just, you know, lead people on like this, you know, this chain of question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, okay? So you're making suggestions like what could we investigate next? What further research could we do on this topic? And not maybe you, but maybe somebody else who happens to read your article and be inspired and want to take that and take your data and 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 try one step further with that, right? Um, finally, at the end of your article, you'll have your references. So no matter what style you're using, if you're using MLA or APA, or Chicago style, uh, which I don't think I've used Chicago style in 20 years, but English Teacher Forum uses Chicago style. The citation styles are all very, very similar, which is good. 
but they're so similar that sometimes you're like, wait, is it is it period here or is it period outside the parentheses? Is it comma or is it no comma? I mean, th these little differences. Um, I find myself, no matter what I'm writing, I'm always double and triple checking how to write my sources out. So at the end of your article, you'll have your reference page. So whether it's called references or works cited, you'll have all of your sources that you cited in mostly your introduction, your literature review. Um, you're gonna have those in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, one great resource that I use for that is um, the OWL, which is the online writing lab at Purdue University. They make it very easy, no matter what type of source you're trying to cite, they have all of the rules spelled out for all the different citation styles so that you have examples, how to cite a book, how to cite uh, an article with one author, an article with two authors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here's an example of that chart of data that I included earlier. Here's that beautiful uh, citation to go in the reference list, right? So again, your article also, it the references do two things. Number one, it proves to the readers that you did your homework and that you're not just, you know, talking out of the side of your mouth. It proves to your readers that you have read about this topic, you are well-versed, you are knowledgeable about, about this topic and you're contributing to the discourse. Number two, it gives them a place for their own research, right? Scholars helping scholars. They, they like that article that you referenced. They wanna learn more about it. They see exactly where to access it. They see the full title, the publishing information, or even the links that they can click on and find themselves. Okay, so just to review the structure of a research article, we have our abstract, we have our introduction, which is like our why, why am I doing this? Our methods, which answer the question how, how did I conduct my study? The results, well, what did I get? And then the discussion or the conclusion, well, so what? Well, what's so significant? I collected this data, these are the results, this is how I interpret it. This is the story that my data tell. And then finally at the end, the references. All right, let's do some quick uh, true or false about the conventions of writing. Conventions of writing, true or false. Number one, an academic article should never use first person I or we. Is that true or false? What do you think? Give me a thumbs up if you think it's true or you could put it in the chat. What do you think, true or false? An academic article should never use first person. Uh, so, can I, can I be a bad teacher here? I'm gonna be a bad teacher. And I'm gonna say, it depends. Usually no, usually that is usually that is true. Usually it is true, you should never use first person in an article. You should never use I, right? It should be objective, it should be third person. However, depending on the publication, depending on the type of article you are writing, sometimes it is okay to reference I or we. I literally just submitted an article for publication last night where not only did I use I and we, but my co-author and I referred to each other by first name in the article. <gasps> we're, we're, it's, it's, it's okay, the article police are not going to come and arrest us. It depends on the conventions of the publication. English Teaching Forum, on AmericanEnglish.state.gov, you are you are okay to use I and we. If you are telling about your own experiences and you want to say I, 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 you're okay to do that. Other journals that are more social science journals about education, those are going to be more strict about not using first person. So I'm really sorry. I, I kind of tricked you here. I told you true or false. And then I'm like, well, it depends. So sorry, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> The, the the idea is you wanna check your submission guidelines for the specific publication that you're looking to submit to. There is a time and a place to use I in academic writing. It's, it's okay sometimes. 
All right, let's try number two. Number two, you can use contractions such as they'll and it should have. What do you think, true or false? True or false in academic articles. You can use contractions. This one's not a trick question. This one, there's definitely like a true or a false answer, I promise. All right, this one is false. This one's false. You should avoid contractions. You should spell out, they will, it should have. Um, contractions in general for formal writing are not, not expected, right? So please don't use contractions. All right, finally, number three, writing in passive voice is best. Writing in passive voice is best. What do you think, true or false? Or is it another trick question? It might be a trick question. Okay, writing in passive voice is best. I'm gonna say this is true. Writing in passive, writing in passive voice is best, but it's not always necessary. So you could say, for example, the participants were given a survey. That's, yeah, that's normal. Because what would the opposite be? I gave the participants a survey. Mm. So again, it's de it depends on your, it depends on the conventions of the journal that you're submitting to. It depends on the publication and what they expect. But it's not necessarily wrong to not use passive voice. Passive voice is just kind of like the standard. But it's okay if, um, depending on the publication, it's okay sometimes to not use passive voice. Okay. All right. So just to review the elements of formal writing, I'm going to let Sean McLeod just kind of go over some little more reminder details. This is the stuff that we teach our students about writing. But sometimes it's good to just hear it kind of all summed up. Let me make sure that my sound will share. And here we go. It's important for you to use language that's suitable for the task or the assignment that you've been given. Okay, so there's a time for conversational spoken language and there's a time for more formal written language. Now with an academic essay in university or college, you should be using formal writing. Okay, so I wanna give you some tips on how to make your writing more formal and more academic. First of all, you shouldn't be using contractions, words like can't and won't. Give the full form, cannot, will not. Also, you shouldn't be using slang or informal expressions like stuff or adjectives like awesome. It's not formal enough. Also, you should avoid the use of the first person, meaning I, me, and my. Now, students sometimes think, how can I express my opinion if I can't say I think or in my opinion? But look at this example. I think cell phones should be banned in classrooms. If I simply remove I think, then you can see that cell phones should be banned in classrooms is my opinion because I've written it in my essay. Also, you want the reader to be focusing less on you and more on your ideas and your opinions. So removing yourself is a good way of achieving that idea of objectivity. Okay? Also, with me and my, you should avoid using personal examples, uh, experiences from your life or things that happen to friends. Don't really have a place in academic writing. Also, you should try to avoid, in my opinion, you should avoid speaking or addressing the reader directly, meaning using the word you too much. In this example, if you want to succeed, you should follow this process. For me, it sounds too casual and too familiar. Using a pronoun like one uh, is a little bit more general and uh, I think sounds a little bit more formal. So this is how I changed it. Following this process will increase one's chances for success. Same meaning, just a little bit more formal. Okay, also, 
Try to avoid using overly emotional language. If the reader thinks you're being emotional, they may think you're being irrational, in which case they may not see your arguments as valid and start questioning your opinions. You also want to avoid overgeneralizations, meaning words like every, none, or all. If you look at this example, everybody knows that smartphones are useful. Now that's not entirely true. Even if there's one person on a mountain or in Antarctica somewhere that doesn't know about smartphones, that means that that uh, sentence is inaccurate, so avoid it. And the last of the list of things that you cannot do is use stati statistics without proper reference. Don't just put a percentage into your essay unless you can tell exactly where it came from. All right, now a couple things that you should do to make your writing more formal is using the passive voice. The passive voice in the impersonal passive again creates that objectivity. It removes you from your ideas um, and it's quite successful. If you look at this example, it is believed by some that widespread use of technology in daily life is affecting the way people interact with one another. It is believed is a really useful way of reporting other people's ideas um, in a passive formal way. If you want more practice with that, you can check out the video on the impersonal passive and passive voice. And last, try to use more academic vocabulary. Instead of a word like bad, you can use a word like harmful or detrimental. Help can be replaced by facilitate or foster. Things to think about. So when you're writing your essay, make sure when you're proofreading that the language you're using is suitable for the tasks that you've been given. All right? So for more uh, practice with making your language more formal, follow the link at the end of this video. But yeah, some just general reminders about formal writing. The idea is that if you're doing action research in your classroom, no offense, but you are not important. Your participants are not important. It's the data and the results that are important, right? The ideas that are important. So we, we want to depersonalize it because we want people to be able to take a study and replicate it. We want people to be able to take a study that you did and try it again in a different context or with a different uh, a different um, parameter. And so the emphasis is not on the people behind the ideas, but the actual ideas and how they're expressed in the language contributes to that. Speaking of- It's important for you to- Ah, go away. Speaking of the language, I wanna share with you this resource um, that I think is absolutely fantastic for academic writing. It's called the Academic Phrasebook. I'm gonna put this link in the chat. It is a free downloadable resource for academic phrasings. What do I mean by academic phrasings? I mean, whenever you're writing a, portion, a part of a research paper and you're like, how do I explain that idea? I don't know. I don't want just wanna say it says, it says, it is determined, it is determined, right? Like, ugh. I need some ready to go phrasings. I need some ready to go sentences to be able to, um, what's it called? Uh, express my ideas. So let me um, actually, um, let me actually just share that right now. I'm gonna hop over to that because I want you to see this. It's so useful, the academic phrase book. So Academic Phrasebook, it's a it's a downloadable PDF. Um, thank you, Dr. John Morley at the University of Manchester for sharing this. So for example, um, I, I need some ways to, to be critical of an idea. I need some ways to say I'm describing a trend. I need some ways to say I'm, you know, explaining causality, right? So this is it here, you can download and then you just see, let me scroll down to where he gets to a section here. Look at this, establishing the importance of the topic for the world or society. So in your literature review, in your introduction, 
X is fundamental to. X has a pivotal role in. X is an important aspect of, et cetera. I mean, you see how many different suggested ways to say this is important, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, speaking practice is important for students to develop fluency. Yeah, duh, okay. But the way that you can phrase it, I mean, it's there's more creativity here. It's like, okay, I need, I need a different way to state this. Um, highlighting an important problem. I mean, this is just, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morley. Ways to um, give a synopsis of the literature in your literature review. Recent evidence suggests, previous studies have reported, studies show the importance of, several attempts have been made too. I mean, it's just like, pick one. Pick one you like. If you're having a hard time creating these words on your own, I know you're tired, your brain is fried from your busy, busy day, right? But here you go. Here's some like quick reference. Here's how I can phrase this. It has been noted, it has been argued, shown, reported, assumed, suggested, established, demonstrated, conclusively shown. So all these different functions of explaining ideas in your writing, there's there's a way to phrase it in this in this PDF here. So I hope you'll find that useful, at least even just to pass along to your own students in, as they're writing. Um, uh, I just I just think that that's a, a really helpful resource because you get tired of saying the same thing over and over again, right? Okay, and then, oops, hold on one second. Let me just find my other screen here. And just to finish out our session tonight, okay, um, uh, quick words about format. Obviously, we want our um, publications. For Roundtable Magazine, we would like the submissions 1.5 uh, spaced between lines. Some publications will ask for double space. Um, size 14, size 12 or size 14 font, Times New Roman, one inch margins, about two and a half centimeters, da, 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 da. Um, if you include any pictures, any figures, charts, graphs, tables, pictures of student work samples, those should have a caption. So as you're typing the document and you insert an image, you should make sure it has a caption. Figure one and then a title. Figure two and then a title. Um, if you're um, if you're using participants, aka the students in your classes or teachers, uh, colleagues that you've surveyed or talked to, so anybody, any human being that you're collecting data from, you want to make sure that if you quote them, if you quote specific words, like say you did an interview or say you had students um, uh, complete a questionnaire and have some free writing where they could voice some opinions or ideas of their own, make sure that you anonymize them, um, make sure they understand that their names and their identifying information will be kept confidential. That's an expectation for you know any publication. Um, if you do decide to quote a student, you can refer to them as student one, or you can give them a pseudonym. Um, especially when you give, when you send out an article for review, um, when it goes out for peer review, if you have any personal identifying information in there, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, maybe reject that. You also want to make sure that you have consent. You have consent to share um, students' words. You have consent to cite them. If you want to include a picture or a description um, or a quote from student work sample then you have to make sure you have their consent. Um, so it's always a good idea to make sure, be, you know, you can, you always have to get, you know, students consent even to participate. If you're giving a survey to, you know, the 25 students in your uh, intermediate class, you have to make sure that those 25 students know that anybody can, can choose to participate or not. It will have no effect on their grade or their standing in the class. You have to make sure that you have consent from your administration too. Make sure you have consent from your, your school, your department, your uh, institution that you're following their protocols. You don't want to have a brilliant study. You don't want to have an amazing article that gets picked up and published 
and everybody's posting it and sharing it and everything. And then all of a sudden, like somebody like in an office somewhere is like, what? We never, we never said this was okay. You you're representing our students or the university in, in a way that we're not okay with. So make sure you're following your institution's procedures for consent. Um, or IRB, I mean, in these kind of, um, if you're doing studies with just like language teaching, um, you know, you're not giving people medications or experimenting on them like that, but they do have to be informed of the risks of participation. They have to know that they can opt out at any time, that their information will be kept private, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just make sure that you're collecting your data, data in a health, healthy way, basically. Okay, um, and then of course for formatting, re references. Um, citation generators, uh, cite this for me, these little extensions that go in your internet browser. I mean, they save you all the time and trouble um, of having to type it out with the right commas and italics in the right places. Oh, wow, look at my beautiful reference list. Oh my gosh, how gorgeous, right? This is my, I feel like that's like when you finally finish your references, your reference page at the end of your article, you're like, okay, now I'm finally done. It's more exciting to discuss your ideas and discuss your data. That's the exciting part. This is the part that's tedious. This is like you cooked a beautiful, delicious dinner and everybody partook of the meal and it was absolutely delicious. And now you have a sink full of dishes, but you're not truly done until you finish washing the dishes. You're not truly done until you have your references and your, or your work cited page formatted and complete. All right, does anybody have any burning questions about writing academic articles? Anything keep you up at night? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll just say thanks for joining us. We are at the 45 minute mark, which is perfect. Um, thanks for attending. Um, I do hope that you'll submit something for the Olympiad, for the article competition. Um, you can follow Lingua Foundation on social media. The specific guidelines for article submission, like where to send the article and all the little reminders about font size and margins, all the little technical stuff, those guidelines are coming out very soon. Um, we're just finalizing them before we publish them. Um, but we also hope that you'll think big and you know share what you're doing with, with the large audience too. If, if not Roundtable Magazine, or in addition to Roundtable Magazine, um, you know, we'd love to see you, um, you know, have, you know, publish your work in other places too, um, because we know you're doing great things. And, and that's the whole point of being an educator is to have a community where we can share, right? We share ideas, we learn from each other. So I'll, I'll leave you with my references. Ha ha ha. Very last page has to be the references, right? Um, that's all I have. Um, if there's anything else anybody would like to ask or share. Uh, the floor is yours. Otherwise, we're going to close out this meeting here. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Next week, we will be having another online session about um, writing research articles. Um, this will be um, conducted by my colleague and friend, Eric Rosales, who's at Osh State University this year. Um, that's going to be next Thursday at 7 p.m. We're going to have another online session about writing, uh, about research and writing. Um, so join us for that or, you know, spread the word to your colleagues too or to your students even. Um, and that's that's all I've got. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Katie, very much. Uh, yes, talking about the next uh, week session, we will also distribute uh, the link. It's coming on Monday and hope it will be useful. Join us again next week. Thank you, Katie, for today's session. It was very informative. Okay, uh, everyone have a good evening.